We've also become acutely aware that we've got to go it alone. In the same way as I don't think a major publisher would have ever picked up a title like Valheim, I don't think that major publishers are really prepared to take big risks with new genres. And uh, I certainly think, and I think many on the team do as well, that as game developers, we should be taking risks and trying new things and seeing how they turn out. So we're going to be going it alone, which means we have to figure out how we market the game. You know, we've focused a lot of time and effort on making the game. And, uh, and now we have to build our, our team and grow our team to be able to actually explain what the game is. We realized that there were a bunch of things we couldn't do, but one of the things we could was focus on the world building experience. And I really thought back to the impression for me of Interstellar at the start of it, when they do those sort of Ken Burns style documentary interviews. And it really grounded the experience well. So we wanted to do the same thing. We wanted to present to the players what had happened, as well as explain the game and you know, make you feel like it, it matters. After our early release to people, there were a lot of questions that got raised. So as we focused just in the project in general, but as well as with this first trailer, we really focused in on answering those questions and also figuring out how we can show off this idea of sessionized gameplay. We didn't want to monetize the game wrong. And actually for quite a long time, we weren't sure whether we could deliver the product as a free to play title. Uh, and we wanted to be very deliberate if we were gonna switch away from that. I still really want to see a free to play survival game, but going it alone, we just felt it was too risky. Either not getting enough revenue or monetizing the game in a wrong way that it becomes pay to win because that can absolutely just destroy the experience completely. You can take an otherwise good game and completely ruin it when someone would have been quite happy to pay a standard amount for the experience. Like you're actually exploring as, as we'd intended. And even like, see here the animals, we've got this deer, it's got a little baby deer oh. beside it. We really tried to just make everything alive. They have their own like life cycle they go through. They'll go find water when they're thirsty. They'll go find food when they're hungry. Someone will cruelly kill that deer's child. We're on trailer trailer number two, which was a whole lot different from our first trailer, being that we were going to do a whole lot of live action to just mitigate the fact that we didn't have a lot of time and resource to do a whole lot of cinematic, you know, vistas and all that kind of thing in game. Dean and Henry came up with the idea for interviewing what was the first cohort, but way in the future. So we're like old guys looking back. We had a great time casting. We had some really good characters. Mo turned out to be a bit of a hit, along with also Stig Larson. I mean, I've come from a background of television and it was really interesting being back on set, but as the client instead of the production. Shoot went really well and we got it all done in a day. We did have a small lockdown in that process, which put us back two weeks. In the end, where we thought we had like a nice breathing room before our launch date, ended up hitting right up to the very last day. One of the best things that happened with that was Dean telling marketing that they weren't allowed to view it and I got to tease Stephen about this for weeks, which was uh, really good because that meant that when we revealed it to the whole of the studio, no one had actually seen too much of it. They'd seen bits and pieces and glimpses, some odd set photos, and then we got to play the whole thing down to the studio. Really enjoy the comments from the Discord community and all of the bits and pieces they've been able to find in it. And we do have one hidden prop to say in one of the shots. Sam's put in um, a certain stick man. So if anyone can find that, they'd get bonus points. Really fun process. And we're about to do it all again for the next one. And we're, we're trying to do a serious take on survival. So I think we'll look for ways to introduce that, but not in a way that's cheap. And I think it'd be very easy to be cheap. Make the player care about the drop, make the player care about their character. Um, that's going to be the bulk of our work for the next two months. But I also feel like recipes, um, comparatively to the ability to scale and deliver on those things. Uh, yeah, so testing this game has been a lot of fun. It's been a game in itself um, to come in open up the game, see how it looks, see how it feels, but also to be the player that tries to exploit it 
and uh, try and identify these things early. You know, you got your exotics and that's the most valuable resource in the game. So I'm trying to hone in on how can that be manipulated. Finding such bugs as, uh, you know, dropping the meta on the ground and someone else picks it up really fast or putting the meta somewhere and destroying that. I've promised the test team if they find stuff like that, I'll give them some beers uh, because that's definitely worth it if uh, a new player sees an exploit like that. You know, we do our functional testing, we do our, you know, all the other aspects, performance, security and all that. Um, but looking up exploits um, and all that is, is a game in itself. Um, so yeah, it's been a lot of fun. So we knew that in Icarus you'd be building a lot, all the time. Uh, we wanted to make sure that our building mechanics were robust, they were easy to use, and they were streamlined. You know, what we did is we looked at a lot of other games, a lot of survival games, and we thought to ourselves, how could we make something that you could engage with over and over again that would feel really good? And what we came up with originally was, was great. It was a robust, snappy system that was easy to use. But after feeling it out and playing with it, we realized that because we're going to be doing this so much, we wanted to be people to really make sure they could uh, invest in their buildings and do a lot of great things with it. Uh, especially when games like Valheim came out and they had, you know, great beams and you could create these really cool longhouses. We wanted people to be proud of their structures. And even though structures in Icarus are mostly temporary because they get destroyed by storms, we still wanted building them and making them enjoyable. And it's kind of cool when something resets all the time because you get to recreate and, and reimagine your home. Mason just championed that. He took our original basic concept, which is grid-based and snap-based, and added in all interesting types of buildable that you can use to uh, construct your dream hut really, your hunting lodge or whether you want uh, some kind of giant stone fort. And then after that we thought to ourselves um, we need to make it meaningful for the player to upgrade your building. You know you start with a wood tier harboring away from your first storm and then after that you've realized that lightning burns wood and we have this whole fire system that destroys the base. We thought building tiers, you know stone tier that can help um, against those lightning problems and then metal tiers which are easy to manufacture on mass when you've got the resources. Uh, it really helped us kind of create a lot of interesting breadth and longevity to the building cycle in Icarus. And I'm super stoked with the tech that Mason managed to put together for it because it feels really good. Some great innovations as well from our UI and UX guys that looked at how we could uh, broadcast our snapping system to the players and how those uh, icons and, and kind of readouts would help. And it's really neat watching a new player build with our game for the first time because I think we've really nailed it in terms of that intuitiveness. Uh, you can see people building really nice structures from scratch by themselves. And it feels nice when you're on a lakefront and you've got a nice big wooden longhouse uh, with windows and doors and then lightning strikes and the whole thing burns down. <laughs> Wait, it is. Yes, it is! <laughs> so through this milestone, the biggest thing was how we sell the game to players. And this in-universe documentary was really exactly what we wanted to do. And look, in many ways, I felt like it was all we could do. And often that's a terrifying prospect on a team. And I think as a measure of how awesome our team is, our only option became our best option. We weren't paralyzed by the fact that it was the only thing we could do. And we really sat down and said, how can we make this work? Uh, very quickly, we found that people understood exactly what we were saying. It was very punchy, it was very cost effective, just proved an excellent way of explaining what we were trying to do and trying to pull people from this thing we believe our genre needs to something that people actually want in our genre. We did learn a few lessons along the way. You know, we need to do a better job of explaining why session-based is good. Uh, the session-based became associated with, I only have this much time on the drop, which isn't necessarily true. So, you know, no plan survives contact with the enemy. So for us, there's a lot of lessons we learned about how we went out there with it. And we get a chance to apply that with our development dev streams and our future interactions with the community. But for everyone, it's sort of a fantastic milestone to see the game actually get really properly put out there for the first time. And everyone's very excited about being able to actually play the game live with customers for them to see.